It's time for another episode, episode 23 of the Pulling Each Other Along show with Dave Clark, Doug Cornfield, and Dave Geis. How are you guys doing today? I need to turn this music off. This is a new music system for us today. Um, uh, we've got a special show for you today. I'm actually kind of fairly excited about this show. Uh, one of the reasons I'm excited about it is because we did a little twisty on Dave Clark today, and we're going to make Dave Clark our special guest. And he kind of <laughs> just found out about it. So um, we're we're calling this uh, the summer winging it. This is the first show we're actually physically we're doing in the summer. So welcome to Milwaukee. Thanks for uh, listening in to us. This is the 104.1 River West Radio. Uh, WXRW, I think is what the call letters are. And we've got Dave Geis and Dave Clark. And we're glad that you uh, let us do this show. Thank you for um, for listening in. And uh, the Facebook folks, I uh, hope you chat along. We really want your participation. Anybody that's listening on Facebook or watching on Facebook or YouTube, um, we're going to ask Dave Clark a bunch of questions. Um, the winging it is kind of two things. We're completely winging this show tonight. But also, we're going to talk about Dave Clark, the knuckleballer. And uh, we've got his picture here. You can see if you're watching on YouTube and uh, Facebook, we've got him with his knuckleball and how he held it. And we want to talk about what brought Dave Clark to come up with this idea that he could play professional baseball on crutches. And one of the reasons that I thought about this show is because I think it was last night or the night before, somebody that we'd come in contact with over the years through our Disability Dream and Do Sports Camps is Mickey Janice. And there's Mickey, I believe. Uh, that was him in spring training. But he is a knuckleballer that just got moved up to the bigs uh, with the Orioles, Dave's favorite team. And uh, that all happened just recently. And um, here's a picture for those that are looking on the Facebook and YouTube. There's Dave and Mickey literally, I think, talked for an hour about the knuckleball at one of our events. And I think you've had some other connections with him since. So um, Dave Clark, this is your show. You're the guest. Take over. Oh, well, let me ask you guys, first of all, is this a demotion or a promotion? No, that's definitely a promotion. Is it a promotion? I'm the no, guest. So I'm, 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 it's definitely. a promotion. Right. Okay. And then I want to, I want to bump it in salary. That man. <laughs> You're gonna, okay. We'll pay you triple. Wait, you're <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, no. you're worth not, you're worth no. triple the pay. No, we got five dollars a day on the clown, so I'm I'm guessing like five bucks. Shoot, How about man, that would be more than triple. <laughs> hey, <you> go. <laughs> hey, so uh, what was the question? I'm I, you know, I got all well, we, didn't have a, we didn't have a question. We're just <laughs> letting you take over. You're the you let me take over. Well, first of all, the knuckleball is a desperation pitch. It's for guys that got nothing else. It's um. Uh, you can go back to, uh, you know, perfect examples. Tim Wakefield of the Boston Red Sox. He was a, I believe, a first baseman or a shortstop in the minor leagues and wasn't doing well. His batting average was terrible. Uh, so he, out of desperation, one day, with, you know, everybody likes to screw around with the knuckleball. They like to throw it when they're playing catch and they like, and Tim was throwing it in the outfield one day, and one of the pitching coaches said, hey, that's not bad. So said, let's go to the bullpen. He went to the bullpen, and the rest is history. He makes it as a knuckleball pitcher. It was a desperation. No. He, he was probably not going to make it as a position player. Um, for me personally, it was the only way probably I was going to try to reach – or I was going to be able to have a shot at reaching – uh, my goals because I topped out at 79 miles an hour. You can catch that with a Kleenex, um, you know, at the pro level. So I had to implement a another way of trying to accomplish my goals. And, and, and uh, I kind of emphasize that today in a lot of different things. There's a lot of things we do in life that you can reach by going down a different highway than the normal highway. And you've got to figure that out. And uh, so basically, that's how the knuckleball was born. 
for me personally, um, you know, and it, it took several, uh, two, three years before I could figure out the grip, the, uh, the arm angle, the, the, the release point and something that worked for me. And even, even when I did, <laughs> there were nights when I was thinking I should be doing this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there were nice one. If that ball, if, if the knuckleball, if the knuckleball's not working, uh, you're a man standing on a mound naked, man. You're, you're, you're they're, they're, uh, that's not a good sight. That's not, it, it, and 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 the manager wants you to eat up innings, and here you are throwing a knuckleball that's not knuckling, not effective, and. Let me tell you, you can get lit up. And and that's why knuckleballers sometimes have a pretty high ERA is yeah. because it's an inconsistent pitch. But when it's on, when it's on, it's it, it, it's a it's a really uh a neat pitch to uh uh to throw. So yeah, it's a neat pitch to throw, but I tell you what, it's it's a tough one to catch. And, and from your perspective, exactly you know. exactly from your perspective, um there were guys in my career that didn't didn't want to catch the nights that I pitched. And, and, Dave, uh, Dave, I got a question for you. Okay. Um, because you know I deal with a lot of people, and I tell them you played you know minor league baseball, professional baseball from your crutches, and then I say, well, he was a knuckleballer. And if they're not someone who is a baseball person, they literally don't even know what that means. And mm -hmm. so, give us your explanation. The Dave Clark explanation of a knuckleball. Well, uh, I mean, if, if, here's the grip for me. And there's a lot of different grips. This is the one that worked for me eventually. Is four fingers, the two middle fingers. And, and, and a knuckleball is kind of a misnomer because most knuckleballers throw with their fingertips, yeah. Yeah. not with the knuckles. Now, there are guys that do the knuckles, but for the most part, it's thrown with a finger tips and some guys throw it with two fingers R. A. dickey uh i think mickey throws it with two um for me this is what worked and uh a pitch you 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 you're, you're basically uh flinging it so you said winging it as our show tonight you, it should have been flinging it because, <laughs> because you're basically flinging the pitch and you don't want to put if you try to overthrow that pitch it flattens out doesn't do anything right uh you got so you wanted to go in at a certain speed now all right dickie threw the hardest knuckleball i've ever seen thrown you know his was coming in at like 80 and that's that's a lot of speed for a knuckleball and and so you want to you it's a, a pitch that floats and the best way to describe it if it's on is it floats like a butterfly. It's all over the place. And even the pitcher, after you release it, you right. throw it towards the strike zone and you hope. <laughs> and uh, and, and, and uh, most of the time, you can get it near the strike zone, but the ball is fluttering. And the ideal rotation that you want to get is one and a half spins from the pitcher's mound to the plate. If you're doing that, then you've got the perfect knuckleball. And and so, it, it, like I said earlier, it's a desperation pitch. It's not thrown hard. I call it a pitch that I can't mention right here on the radio. Um, and it starts with a P. But um, – and, and and that's why <laughs> most guys don't throw the knuckleball today because we're all about – baseball has changed a lot. P for power. We're all P for power and something else. But anyway, uh, baseball's power on both sides of the ball today. You're either throwing 100 miles an hour or you're hitting bombs. Yeah. You know, nobody's choking up with two strikes, trying to go the other way. They're, they're, they're playing the shift. Uh, you're going to get me going in a whole different direction here. But all guys have to, would have to do to, to, to stop that shift is hit the ball the other way, lay down a couple of punts the other way. But nobody's doing that. Nobody's going to do that today. No, they're they're either getting it over the shift or through the shift. And so the knuckleball is a dinosaur. There, Mickey 
Mickey Janis, who's with the Orioles now, as you mentioned earlier, is pro I, I I don't know if there's another knuckleballer right now. Wouldn't no, a knuckleballer? Was, I think he was the first one. And yeah, in, I, I, because, it, 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 and and you can see his grip. He's got the two fingers on the ball. Um, but the pitch is a dinosaur because we're so enthralled with power today. Yeah. Nobody and and you know you know the story, Doug. You were right there yeah. uh, when I when I gave a talk to the uh, Fort Myers Miracle at the time, the the Twins minor league team in the clubhouse, and I'm giving a talk, and their pitching coach was one of my pitchers. Oh well, wow. back in the day, and he stood up in the locker room and he said guys pay attention to what dave is telling you he's the best pitching coach i ever had and then at the end of the talk i told the guys if any of you guys uh want to talk knuckleball i'd be happy to talk to you whatever and the same guy stood up and said no 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 knuckleballs and that's the mentality today so the pitch is a it's a dying breed it's kind of weird because I, you would think that if everyone's trying to hit a home run that knuckleball would be even more effective absolutely you're oh, dead right. on i mean i yeah. would have I, I would have much rather had i ever made it to the show i would have much rather pitched to a reggie jackson yeah, yeah. than a mark belanger yeah and that's and guys are going what but those guys that overswing mm -hmm. are the guys you can get out on their front foot before the pitch reaches the plate. Exactly. And, and now now they're just hitting with the bat. They're just swinging with the bat. So and we got to get to Reggie Jackson and basically say, Reggie, Dave would have gotten you out. No doubt. No doubt. No, yes. Jackson. Hey, uh, we, let's, let's pull in our, uh, our Facebook friends here. Uh, Tom's got a question for you, Dave. He says, Dave, as far as you know, who was the first knuckleball pitcher in the majors or minors? Hmm. Who's the oldest one you know? Willie Wood? Oh, well, I think it was probably someone before that. Uh, probably somebody. Right, for me that. personally? Yeah, who would be me, the oldest one you know? personally, I go back to um, – Or are you the oldest one? Uh, Wilbur, Wilbur Wood. Wilbur. <laughs> I go back to Wilbur Wood threw a knuckleball. Um, White Sox. Um, uh, there was another one. Uh, Wilhelm? Hoyt Wilhelm threw the knuckleball. Um, so those are guys that 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 I go at. The knuckleball goes way back. Yeah. I mean, I, and there was a and and of course, Doug, you know. Yeah. We a guy on my, the show tonight, actually. I with my same name wrote a book about the knuckleball. Yeah, that was so odd when I first started promoting Dave's story. Uh, David kind of knew about this, and then there was a guy, and I, I we should get him on the show someday. That would be an interesting show. Yeah. Um, but th there's a guy that wrote a book uh, called The Knuckle Book, and I reached out to him and finally got his email somehow, and I sent him an email one day telling him about Dave Clark, and he looks into what I had on the internet at the time and his website, and he emails me back because he, he had done all this research on the knuckleball. And his philosophy was anybody with any kind of athletic ability can throw the knuckleball and be successful if they just practice enough. Uh, I think that's one of his premises. And then here I'm telling him about Dave Clark, who had a 10 year career in the minor leagues pitching off a knuckleball. And he said my email to him was like finding a 747 in his driveway that he didn't know was there. <laughs> Wow. And so I, I, it's uh, so, and and then the weirdest thing, his name is literally Dave Clark. <laughs> really, yeah. really, hundred yeah. percent, Dave Clark. He lives in uh, Massachusetts, and so I mean, I'm Facebook yeah. friends with him, and if you you know pull up Dave Clark on my friends list, he probably would come up. So yeah, maybe maybe Tom knows him. Lives in Massachusetts. Yeah, because people started asking me, oh, did he write the book, you know, about the knuckleball? And I'm like, what? You know, <laughs> So finally, we had to put two and two together, and it was a Dave Clark that wrote the knuckleball book. So, so Dave, uh, you said the knuckleball is a desperation pitch. Is that why you were trying to teach me to throw a knuckleball down to second base as a catcher? I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mean, batting average was pretty low, so <laughs> might be a good might be a good good point there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh. 
so Dave, what's one of your favorite knuckleball stories or, or even least favorite or most memorable? Well, obviously the Comiskey park, uh, game is most memorable. Um, the, uh, you know, I came in out of the bullpen with two out with one out and a runner on two runners on base. And, um, uh, we were ahead by a run, so I got the first out, and then Dave, here, here comes your, you know, your your point that you made earlier. Um, so I got the first out. We're still ahead three two. They got two runners on, and I strike out the next guy. Game over, right? Uh, Wrong. Yeah. The third strike knuckleballed right through my catcher, yeah. and uh, so with two outs. You know, even if the bases are occupied, they can run. And so now I got a bases loaded situation. And my next knuckleball was air mailed into the right center field gap. And uh, we went from winning 3 2 to losing 4 3. Yikes. So that, that's a, uh, uh, a memory, for, not a good one, but a memory from, from, from Comiskey Park. The other uh, one that comes directly to mind is. Uh, when I was uh, pitching in the Phillies organization and got loaned. And uh, two weeks later, I came back to pitch against the team that I was loaned uh, from. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I shut them down for, for uh, eight innings. And uh, so that was memorable. We ended up winning that game three to two. Uh, so that, that was a memorable time. Uh, most I ever struck out in a game and I've been used as a, I, I, a knuckleball pitcher is going to get used and abused, uh, in, 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 uh, so many different roles, uh, because I, I was a starter. I was a middle reliever. I was a closer. Um, so I've had experience in all of those different facets of pitching and there's a different mentality to each of those that you got to deal with. So, um, you know, that, that, uh, and, and most I ever struck out in the game is seven. So, um, but one of the good things that, that I have in my knuckleball was, um, I generally had pretty good control. Um, and you know, I would mix in my 79 mile fastball and, and I had a 12-6 curve. And so you mix all those pitches up. The, the problem today is there's a lot of throwers. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't pitch. Right. Pitching is changing speeds, getting the hitter off balance. Uh, throwing is rearing back and throwing a ball as hard as you can. Yeah. And when you can throw 100 miles an hour, I guess you don't have to worry about pitching. Uh, but... Um, uh, even at the pro level, 100 miles an hour, they're they're going to catch up with that uh, at, at a certain point. And um, but uh, you know there were a lot more pitchers back in the day. Uh, today there's a lot more throwers. And the other the other thing is a lot of the pitchers don't spend enough time in the minor leagues today. They they rush them to the big leagues. And there's so much to pitching that um, so many little things that 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 lead to success that they they're learning at the big league level. They're making the mistakes at the big league level where it used to be that, you know, you would make those mistakes in the minor leagues. So Dave, I have a, I have a question for you and I don't even know if I've ever really ever asked you this question before, but here, you know, here's a picture of Dave for those that are watching on Facebook and YouTube uh, where he's playing little league baseball from his clutches. This was a picture that actually went through the AP wire on the newspaper and, um, Dave didn't even know that until later in life when I found that it was all over the newspaper in New York. But that picture, I mean, here you're a 12 year old. Um, they even had you playing in the outfield at times, yeah. I think, you know, in Little League. Yeah. And you're you're a guy that's pretty competitive. I'll just I'll just say I thought I was competitive until I met Dave Clark, and then I realized how not competitive I really was. <laughs> and how is how is it that a twelve year old like you understands 
the desperation that you're talking about and starts working on the knuckleball. And, and because this is the pulling each other along show, who helped inspire that for you? Well, I go right back to, you know, to my dad. I mean, he was, he was my catcher. He'd sit in the driveway while I was throwing, uh, even after I started. And, and I didn't start really throwing the knuckleball until I was maybe 14. Uh, but I can remember when I was eight years old, and because of my limitations, developing a real sense of, uh, a, of analyzing the sports, hockey, baseball, football, basketball, because uh, we played them all in the neighborhood growing up. And But I got to the point where I analyzed each sport and figured out where my limitations would let me fit in to be most successful at that sport. So, you know, as I grew older in, in, in baseball and you start when you, when you, in any, in, in, in life, actually, uh, you know, as you go higher in up the pyramid, I call it. Uh, and you, Doug, you know, you know, Dave, you, you know, as a runner, Dave is a baseball player, the higher you go, in that pyramid, the tougher the competition gets and the more people fall off the pyramid and, and get eliminated. So at eight years old, you know, I'm thinking, okay, for me, pitching and first base are the two positions there that lend their, uh, that, that my, my strengths lend me to be successful at. Um, and then as I grew older, um, you know, you, you start specializing a little bit more and, and, uh, the, the, uh, it became apparent that, and I think I was maybe 14, 15, 16, maybe when I decided I, I wanted to try to go the highest level that I could get to, um, then it becomes apparent that you gotta you gotta start going on oh, how do I get there? And 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 uh, you know, my I still remember my little league coach, his name. Uh, you know, what, my dad was an assistant on the team, but Phil Ritz was the man who uh, started pulling me along in baseball because he gave me the opportunity to play in little league. And uh, you know, he was there and he supported me and and, and help me get started in the game. And, uh, uh, so, so those are the people that pulled me along. My dad was there the whole way. I mean, just playing catch, as I said, and, uh, squatting down and, 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 and catching my pitches, you know, catching my fastball, my curveball, my, my knuckleball when I was trying the, the other, the other thing is though, I think you gotta be self-motivated. Uh, there, there, there's pull, people pull you along you can pull yourself along. And I think you have to get self-motivated because that's where my throwing against the brick wall came in. You know, I would, I would tape a strike zone on a brick wall right down the street from our house, take a bucket of balls and go down there and try all the different grips, arm angles, release points. And that's how I actually found out what worked for me. It's, it's funny you say that because I remember doing the same type of thing. You know, the rubber coated baseball. Yeah. You just see how far, I would just see how far away I could get and still get it in that, that box on the wall. You know, same kind of thing. So, how did you learn the knuckleball, though? I mean, did somebody actually teach you the grip and all that? They or didn't. did you self learn? They didn't. It was, uh, it was, uh, and you go back to those guys, Wilbur Wood, Hoyt Wilhelm. You know, I saw the pitch, and, and being a baseball fan, you know, I, I kind of analyzed maybe a little more than most kids would. Um, but I, I said, I think I can throw that. Yeah. I, let me let me try that. And since I'm only throwing 79, I realized, you know, quickly, it, when you start getting in your teen years, uh, that's where a lot of dreams die because uh, guys right. realize I haven't got it. I, yeah. I, I don't, I don't have it. I was a star in little league, but for whatever reason, 
I don't have it now. And uh, but for me, I kept wanting to have that dream fueled. And uh, so I actually taught that pitch to myself. Nice. You no, know, I, I, I really did. I, uh, I said, let me try this pitch because I realized 79 isn't going to get me there. And uh, maybe if I can, and I had a decent curveball. You know, I had a decent 12-6, but, uh, but, you know, my, my curve's coming in at 70 or upper 60s and, and fastball at 79, they're not going to cut it. It's not going to cut it. So I had to add that third pitch. And that was it. And 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 so it, again, desperation. You want something bad enough, you'll figure out a way to try to get there. Yep. Doesn't always work, but you know if you want something bad enough and you're willing to put the time in and the effort, figure out a different road to go down. So, Jimmy, tell us about your best season. Let's go there. Yeah, you know, we've got a few more uh, minutes left on the radio. Let's talk about your best season. Um, I, I, I would I would uh, uh, go to uh, probably two seasons uh, because as I as I I'm explaining to you, Doug, I don't like being called major league prospect because I really never was. Uh, Except I, that a major league owner was calling you and interested in having you move up. Yeah, but we've that, had this discussion, and I, I'd probably we, win if we did a vote. We 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 have, but. Basically, there's three, four, five guys per minor league roster that are considered prospects. Well, you can't play with three or four to five guys. The rest are roster fillers. They're called roster fillers. Basically, that's what I was. <laughs> that's that's and Dave's story. So Dave and I are in the same boat. Basically, that's what I was. I was a roster filler. Uh you know, you go back to my career, there were really just two, maybe three fairly good years. One one was 75 with the Indianapolis Clowns. We had a heck of a team. Uh, I worked my way into being a closer. Um, you know, I was uh, probably the last pitcher that was kept that year. And, and I worked my way into being a closer role, and I ended up winning four games losing none and saving 20. Um, and then you fast forward to probably 1977, uh, which I was a starter that year and uh, went nine and four. Uh, so, and then if you, you know, the third fairly good year was, was the year I got loaned out, uh, you know, and, uh, and that was in 1980 and I went six and four. So for a team that lost over a hundred games, so that was this. That I was Steve Carlton. There you go. You were the Steve Carlton of that team. So, uh, so this has uh, been an interesting conversation. That's actually gone by really, really fast uh, for our winging it with the knuckleballer Dave Clark and the the bullpen catcher Dave Geis and myself Doug Cornfield. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this. In about thirty seconds, we're going to do a little extra. I've got a video of Dave pitching that we're going to show on the the Facebook side. So in Milwaukee, if you want to listen in, go to the Pulling Each Other Along Facebook page. We'd love to have you there. And uh, again, this has been the 104.1 River West Radio. And the special guest today was our own co-host, Dave Clark. And uh, Dave Geis with uh, Doug Cornfield. Good night, Milwaukee. We will see you in a week. Hopefully with another guest. <laughs> Good night. There we go. I don't know how good that music came through, but uh, as promised, I do have a little video that I want to show, and I'm going to just do that right away for those that are still watching. Um, this is some clips of a interview that happened uh, for Dave, and I've just I've I've taken bits and pieces of this and it's uh, an interview from an actually a former NBA basketball player who had a cable television show in Corning and uh, it shows Dave pitching not necessarily the knuckleball but I think you get a little bit of a better feel and uh, we're going to go into that.
is going to be uh, moving over to Sweden to play ball here very shortly. We want to talk to him, and we also want to remind you that it's rather windy here today. If you hear and, uh, pitch and coach for a, a Division I Swedish club, uh, they got in touch with me, and uh, it was an offer that was too good to refuse, and I figured I'd better jump at it now. I may not have the opportunity again. And you're leaving very shortly, aren't you? Right. I'll be leaving in less than a week now. Uh, there. Okay, you're out on the mound now, and you're all set to, to let go, and look at that. Boy, you swing that. That looked great, you know. But tell me, uh, Dave, where did you come across this? I don't. I, I really don't know, Bob. I've been asked that question a lot of times, and uh, uh, it's it hasn't come easy, but it came natural. Um, I guess it was more out of a forced way of doing things. That's the I guess the only way that I would be able to throw. And it started back when I was eight years old, and I've just perfected the motion. Well, the motion is so beautiful. I, I enjoyed particularly, friends, when I watched Dave follow through. Now, there's a prime example where follow through saves your arm because of your hitching motion, but you end up with a smooth parallel follow through. I appreciate that, Bob. Geez, that's the first time everybody's ever told me that. <laughs> well, how about that? Earned run average with the Indianapolis Clowns there for a while. Well, in 75, I had a good year. It was probably my best year in pro ball. I had a 4-0 record and 20 saves and a uh, good earned run average, but the next year wasn't so good, so we won't talk about that. <laughs> You're building that right. year. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, now in that Swedish league, uh, you'll be playing with that, that particular club, and it's a group of eight clubs, you say? Right. So that's going to be quite a league. Isn't it? Should be. Should be. I'm looking forward to it. Hey, well, drop us a note, will you? I will, definitely. Hey, we'll want to hear all about that. But now I'd like to hear about your thoughts in concerning the Easter Seal. Now, this is one of our great organizations. They've just had their telethon, but all year round, they need our help and support. What's your reaction? There you go. So Dave Clark, a long time ago, right before he went over to Sweden, and uh, that's a pretty cool clips of some of his interviews. And I think we had a... We had you know, a... Clip. Yeah, man, too. yeah. Yeah. You know, I was, gonna, I was going to bring up the Colgate. The, he, that was like almost in the Colgate boy days, you know. So it's, uh, Dave had his big smile going. A little, a little um, earlier than the Colgate boys. Yeah. So we, I guess we just have a comment here from Laura. I thought it was a question. But Laura is not an athlete. She has limitations. Uh, Laura's been on our show before. But just to let you know, Dave, she's in awe listening to you tonight. That's, that's, that, thank you. And they get, uh, they get they get front row seats as Tom likes to say to our show uh, every every week. So we appreciate uh, them being and also Barbara. Uh, she had a shout out to us as well. Not sure if she's still listening, but uh, hey, Barbara, Barbara hope everything's good. Us. And uh, I think uh, Rusty, you know, Rusty had a couple of comments in there. I think he th I think he thinks you guys are worth ten bucks for ten, your and then ten bucks and yeah, ten bucks too. Ten but you bucks. know. He, he fixed his he fixed his uh, spelling error there, and uh, Angela said she's and, sorry. Yeah, she I'm just, sorry. I, I'm sorry. I missed Angela when I was up on Monday as well. But right. I'm glad you got the newspaper. I left. Right. So, is there any other? You know, if there's any other questions out there, I know last week we we weren't um, a part of the show. It was my anniversary. I actually was at a track meet, and uh, I don't know if anybody saw this. And I was going to ask Dave a question around this. But I have a, another video I'm going to show. Um, this one is actually of my youngest son, uh, who, if I can just get a get a kind of a half shout out, um, it, this is DJ, and DJ basically had some really nice races last week as a as a young freshman runner. Um, he ran a 5K at a, at a time that's about well, it's either sixth or seventh in the nation as a freshman right now. And, uh, and then he came back a day and a half later and he ran this mile. Now, the interesting thing about DJ, he's still learning how to run. He's only been training for about a year. And he was running this mile as a freshman, sophomore mile. Uh, he, did, he still did pretty well. But I want you to watch the video because this is really interesting. DJ has some kind of jet propulsion idea because he slaps himself right before he takes off. So watch it quickly. We're going to show this little video of my son slapping himself to jet propulse himself to the finish line. Here we go. There's two. So, so Dave, I don't know where you went there, Dave, but uh, 
You know, maybe that would have got you to the first base in 10 seconds instead of 12 or 11 or whatever it took you. It was 11. Don't, don't, don't oh, sell okay. me short. Don't 11 sell me seconds. short, man. Don't sell me so, short. No, I never, I never, uh, never had that, uh, <laughs> I guess, that kind of a wake up call, if that's what you want to call I, it. Uh, I guess. I've had managers come out to the mouth. They probably wanted to slap you a few slap times. Slap me around a little bit. <laughs> but uh, no, I never did it to myself. So, uh, yeah, I'm sure some people wanted to slap you around a few times for things you did. But, <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> when, that, when that knuckleball's not working, there's a lot of managers that want to slap you around. So, so they you, know, guys, you, know, you know, one of the good. things, one of the things that um, I, I would have loved to have uh, uh, been a battery with Dave. With Dave guys, I'd have been yeah. loved to have been a battery mate with Dave. Never, we never had that chance because by the time Dave and I ran into each other, I was a, a broken down first baseman. I think so. the only time I caught one of your pitches was during a PM Magazine interview. Yeah, you I, caught I, that one. I think they were behind me, or maybe I think they were behind me, and I remember catching a couple pitches of yours. And I was thinking, you know, this guy hasn't pitched for a while, but every single Knuck and they were all knuckleballs. Every single one of them was a strike. It's like you guys have pitched in a few years and you're still throwing strikes. It's still you that, know, that, you, that, just and, right and, you, and you know that you, you reference that that PM magazine. I that I, I really didn't want to do that. Yeah, I remember because that. Because my elbow was killing me and I, I I remember for like four days afterward I was not in good shape. So why did you do it, Dave? For, think the, for the a, PR, for the you know, to get recognized. I, I I think we had to do it. I think there was some kind of eye candy or it's something. Like there. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. With the with the interview. So, anyway, so we didn't get any more questions from the peanut gallery or the the guys. I'm trying to think if there's any more. Like here, one of the one of the pictures I have of you is. Uh, and we kind of talked about it a little bit, but you pitching uh, your knuckleball over in Sweden. And I, I guess the significance of that is that's really where you pitched for the last time. And um, at least well, you, know, you tried pitching after that. But Well, the last time I actually pitched in the United States was in your background, back backyard was in Reading, Pennsylvania. And um, uh, but, yeah, Sweden is the last. Uh, that's where that's where my arm fell apart. Right. But there's some significance of that year, too, because, you know, I know one of the things that I deal with is people don't think you were a real player or you weren't getting you were a sideshow and, um, you know, all those kind of I things. Was. <laughs> you were a sideshow. Um, but, you know, the reality is in Sweden, uh, if I'm correct, that was the first and only all star team you ever made. Yeah. Yeah, it was, and unfortunately, it was the night there was one game left before the All Star break, and I got the I got the notification earlier in the day, and uh, I was starting the game that night, yeah. and uh, that's my elbow. That's when my elbow snapped that that night, that very night. So uh, I got recognized, but I was never. Never there. Never on the team. Never got to play the All Star game. No, nope. maybe that would, probably, like, that would be like that would be like a sad children's book to write. <laughs> <laughs> we already have people crying reading the Pound of Kindness. So, <laughs> so. Gideon had somebody come up on the street because we've been fundraising again with our stuff, and lady came up in the street and she goes, "I couldn't stop crying when I was reading the Pound of Kindness story." So. <laughs> He gets that. We get that actually quite a bit, but so we don't need to make any more people cry reading one of your books. So, all right. Any any last parting words, Dave Geis, the catcher that never got to catch? Well, I guess you didn't get to catch Dave Clark. Well, I agree with Dave. I wish I had a chance to catch for him. That would have been amazing, I think. Um, yeah, and for me, I wish I would have watched him. I was actually here this summer of 88. Uh, that's, what the, that's the summer I met. <coughs> I met my wife in Corning, but I had no clue. Yeah. That yeah, was their last season. Yeah. 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 It was the last season. Yeah. So, I mean, literally where, from where I'm sitting right here, you're almost playing outside my door, you know, just not even a mile away. 
Uh, Dave, you played in the, in the stadium in Corning, yep. didn't you? Yeah. yeah. That's where we had yeah. that big fight against Whalen. That's right. Fight. We That's we did. That was a good one. Uh, was, uh, here, here in War Memorial? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was like a hockey fight, man. It sure was, man. Dave and, was innocent, uh, though. You guys were both innocent, right? I didn't see much of the fight. I was on the ground in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, though? Dave hated it when we fought. Hated it. And I think there was, yeah, yeah. it might have been the only time we had a big fight, but he was not for it. Not for it. You weren't for it? You probably led the way. No, no. No, if I recall, what, what, uh, what ignited that? It was something, I think it was something that Arnie Castro did. Oh, okay. Is Ar either Arnie or Ramon? But uh, Ramon, one of the two. <laughs> yeah, one of the two started something at the plate. I don't remember exactly, but I know even the umpire, even the umpire, old Sammy threw a punch. Sammy Wheaton. Yeah. Sammy Wheaton. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, uh. Do you remember when we when we released those two guys? Yes, in Michigan, <laughs> Kalamazoo. And, yeah, because they refused to wear the warm up shirt. Yep. Yeah. So I remember, I remember Sal was telling them to put them on, and they were giving them grief. And I, I just said to myself, because we got off the bus, and we were walking to the locker room, and I remember telling myself, if those guys are still, can I say B? Yeah. <laughs> if, those guys, if those guys are still bitching by the time I get to that locker room door, they're out of here. Yep. And sure enough, they were. I turned around and went back on the bus, and I didn't kick um, – Ramona, I said, Artie, pack your stuff. I don't think I said stuff. Not that stuff. And I said, pack <laughs> your stuff. We're driving you to the bus station. You're gone. And then I looked at Ramona. I said, and you've been a pain in that too. And if you want to go, you can go with them. Yeah. So and we did. Left. And they both yeah. left. Down to, back down to Tampa. Uh, so Tom, with all his comedic – uh um references here said lauren he loved the show tonight it flew no it fluttered by <laughs> so there you go and that, uh, might be, that might be a perfect way for us to end uh the uh, the show tonight uh with the river west radio and uh and now our after show talking with dave clark our special guest the flinging it knuckleballer instead of the winging it knuckleballer although we completely won this show tonight um, but uh, again, there's Dave Clark, the famous knuckleballer from Crutches. Oh, we're and, uh, of this. There you go. You can show it real quick. We oh, haven't yeah. cut off yet. Yep. We're, we're, I, I can't get that. Oh, hold on. Get, let me get your. There, let me, let me go. Go. Dave, there you is, go. This is for my son's little league team. Guess what? I, I, I know we're extending the show, but guess what? One of the kids, <laughs> I won't let them throw curveballs. They're, they're 11, 12, 10, 11, 12. So they can't throw curveballs. One of them's picked up the knuckleball. Oh, nice! And, he's, throw, and he's throwing it. He's throwing it. So it's great. Um, anyway, it's a great pitch to teach at that level because even yeah. if it doesn't work, it changes the speed and it changes yeah. rhythm. And absolutely, uh, and it doesn't. Know, hurt, it doesn't hurt your arm. Right. I know my oldest son used that in little league, and um, so we got a high Dave Clark and Doug Cornfield, but I'm not sure from who because it's it's. Uh, but anyway, high back to whoever that was. <laughs> and um, my son used the knuckleball, and it was amazing. He only threw it maybe one or two times oh, in a little game. It. But the coaches would be telling the players, the batters, you know, on the other team, watch for the knuckleball, watch for the knuckleball. And so they're the whole game. They're sitting there watching for a knuckleball as a as a fastball goes by them. All you got to do is throw it one time, and they're going to be looking for it. It's it gets, it gets That's in people's funny. heads, you know, yeah. and. I used to have to tell because Jared actually got to the point where his knuckleball was working. Mm -hmm. And I used to have to tell the umpires, I say, hey, just be aware he's got a knuckleball and just watch it in the strike zone because it would fool the, you know, he would throw it and it'd be moving. It would be a dead strike, but they'd call it a ball because it, it literally just yeah. took them so off guard. Yeah. And I didn't tell him it was my son. I would just tell him, hey, this pitcher's got a knuckleball, so just beware that that doesn't freak you out when it's coming your way. Right. And that tended to work in my favor because once they knew it was coming, they called a called it a more fairly. So, so, David, if you're say you're coaching, you're pitching coach, 
you're pitching good for like eight, nine year olds. You want to teach them a knuckleball or a changeup? Well, I've done both. Okay, okay. with a little league team, my son's playing on. I, I've I've taught both. What you find, it, and it it all depends on on the kid because some of their are some, and and here's the difference in coaching. Uh, you know, I played for coaches that have uh, uh, demanded or 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 or, or, or they, they, you got to do it this way. Yeah, I've yeah. played for those types of coaches. I mean, that's why basically I got loaned. Uh, that year I got loaned because I, a, a person that could, because as you know, Dave, yeah. a million ways to do something in baseball. Right. Right. And you got to find out, you got to find out what works for you. Sure. Of course. And, and, and so at the little league level, you find what I found. And I told them <laughs> the last time I, I, I talked to them this year was last Saturday. They got eliminated because they, they uh, Trey made the all-star team and their all-star team was eliminated in two straight games. Okay. So, uh, so the last thing I, I told them was, uh, uh, this is this is the first experience I've had coaching at this level, and you guys are tougher to coach than any level I've been at. <laughs> so, so, so it's uh, uh, but but what you find at the at this level, and it's all new to me because the first year I really did it was all the hands are different sizes. Sure, of course, and yeah. a lot of them aren't even big enough, like. My own son Trey, uh, you know, he's he was throwing with a three fingered grip yeah, for fastball, yeah. And he just uh, just toward the tail end of this season, went to the two finger grip. And there's a there's a picture that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's just a, that, that's an unbelievable photo. But uh, uh, so I had to I had to, to to answer your question. Change up knuckleball. What I would do is I would find out which kid could grip the ball better one way or the other, because a knuckleball really is a changeup. Well, yeah, it's a form of a change. -up. It's it's a it's a it's a really nice changeup if yeah. you can throw it well, but it it it's a pitch that that should go in much slower than your fastball. Yeah. So so that's what I did. I found out here here here's a grip. Show me a grip for a knuckleball. This is how I did it. This is how you can do it. Yeah. Uh, find out what works for you. This is the change up grip. I threw the circle change. There's a lot of ways to throw. We're getting into the pitching now. But right. uh, so to answer your question, I in I, I individualized it. And and a lot of coaches don't do that. They teach one way. Yeah. That's how you gotta throw. The whole game is about individual, you know, whether you it's pitching, whatever. You bet. I mean, I mean, I was part of an organization, the Chicago White Sox at one time. Yep. That if you remember the name Charlie Lau and Walt Hariniak. Yes. Yeah. Hitting. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And and they taught every level to hit the Charlie Lau way. You can't do that. Right. And I kept telling them that you cannot tell a hitter he's got to hit this way it man you know what i tell a hitter if you can hit 300 standing on your head in the batter's box i'm not going to screw with you stand right. on your stand on your head yep. and 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 uh, the white Sox during that era enforced the hereniac Lao way of hitting from every level yeah i remember hearing a lot about that yep. and and it just and i was in that organization and i kept saying you can't do that Yep. So, Dave, uh, somebody in Facebook user world thinks that the pitching coach, you, I believe, should be fired. <laughs> should should fire the pitching coach. <clears throat> Probably right. <laughs> I figured out I figured out who it was. So, uh, so uh, that's your buddy Dave Gronsky. So I, I agree with you, Dave. Uh, we should fire him as a pitching coach. I don't know. <laughs> Although I think I think the Orioles should be hiring you right now no. so that you can yeah. help out with um, with with Mickey yeah. here and because there's few people that probably could help him like you could. Yeah, that, 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 you know it's it's a good point that you just made, Doug. Because um, even in my career, um, you're a man on an island. 
There are not a lot of pitching coaches that know how to handle. I mean, you go to my buddy Brent Strom, you know. He, Brent, Brent doesn't know anything about the knuckleball because nobody throws it. So you are a man on your, you know, you're. there aren't too many guys. You know, again, you go to R.A. Dickey, Tim Wakefield, Mickey. Um, but but there's not a lot of guys that can help knuckleballers. Right. True. Good point. Yep. Yeah, so that's that's uh, your friend David Gronsky. Just what we yeah, my old hockey teammate. That uh... <clears throat> yeah, we didn't even you know we got to talk about hockey someday for you. But uh, this was about the knuckleball. This was Dave Clark, the flinging it, winging it knuckleballer. I, mean, I don't know. You know maybe, that, maybe that's a children's book title. The flinging, <laughs> it, winging it, knuckleballer. We were talking about the knuckleball this whole show, but he could hold his own at first base too. You could pick it. I've heard. Good. I've heard. Yeah. yeah. But he had to fake throw. So he had to fake everybody out with his throw. Well, I right. did. Well, you know what? You yeah. saved a lot of saved a lot of outs by picking a lot of balls out of the dirt. So thanks, Dave. Yeah. Appreciate that. No, I mean I've I've heard that more than once. The same thing with the hockey is with him yeah. as a goalie. People yeah. say, No, no, he could actually he yeah. could actually stop a puck, you know. It he usually hit him in the face. As, as a goalie, he sucked. <laughs> that's, that's why my head can't turn anymore. <laughs> it's too much of turning back in the day. There's no chiropractor good enough for you, so. Uh, it was some pitching. <laughs> yeah, it was. That's true. That's the that's the uh, the combination of the two, man. Just did me in. Oh. Now, so by the time by the time. I was playing first base with the clowns. My arm was pretty yeah. shot. Yeah, yeah. Pretty shot. Yeah. I got so. it. So, well, our we're almost we're almost pushing an hour here, and uh, it's been fun. But I gotta believe these people that now they're still they're still watching. I'm not even exactly sure why. I think but, uh, away. it's probably <laughs> Tom and Laura. No, there's there's more there's more people watching. Thanks for. Thanks for the comments. We always appreciate the comments. That really is very helpful uh, as we do the show. And uh, tune in next week. Um, trying to get my pulling each other along. Uh, just as an update, the pulling each other along book is actually in getting packaged right now. Uh, working on the website, trying to finalize uh, the new website. So as soon as that up, you know, we're gonna get that going, and we're gonna give people an opportunity to pre-read Terry Bradshaw's forward. Uh, so that's kind of part of the the whole thing that's working right now. And of course, everything takes longer than I wanted to do. Um, but Dave and I also we booked three camps um, coming up. So we have camps in Hickory, North Carolina, with the Crawl Dads and the Texas Rangers organization, August twenty eighth. And then we're going to be in Hickory or no in, in Hudson Valley, uh, September fourth. And then we're going to be back here in Corning, September eleven. And so you can go to d3day.com and that people can sign up for those events for whoever's listening in. And, uh, you know, if you want to support that, there's a way to go to our page and, and throw us some change as well to our disability dream and do fund and, uh, or sponsor us. So if anybody wants to sponsor the camps, they can do that as well. And this year, obviously the fundraising is a lot harder. Um, but we're going to make it, we're going to figure it out. We keep doing it. I don't know how, but uh, it's been great to see you again, Dave Geist. Nice seeing you guys. Again. We, still, we still need to get together. Uh, we're getting a thank you to one of our biggest fans, uh, Tom. Um, you know, and Tom, I appreciate your help too. You've been pulling us along, and so we are we are really helpful and appreciative of that. So, but I'm gonna I'm gonna make an end here today. I don't know if we want to hear this music or not. No. <laughs> But this has been the after show, pulling each other along. Dave Geis, Dave Clark, let's all say goodbye. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for joining us.